गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन नमस्कार सो ओवर दी लास्ट डे एंड हाफ वी हैव बीन डिस्कसिंग अबाउट वेरियस थीम्स अराउंड मैरी टाइम एंड वन ऑफ द की पीसेस ऑफ दिस एंटायर इको सिस्टम इज द शिप बिल्डिंग पीस सो दिस इज अ क्रिटिकल यू नो एस्पेक्ट एंड वन नीड्स टू लुक एट इट हाउ इट्स शेपिंग अप if you look at the uh, past decade the global economic ecosystem and the value chains they have suffered multiple shocks which have you know brought to fore how fragile the supply chain resilience is be it the covid when those restrictions were there or the war in ukraine or the recent uh, israel hamas conflict and the red sea crisis that we have seen all of this have highlighted the dangers that are associated with not having a resilient supply chain and this has led to huge massive supply chain shocks and ultimately like leading to inflation in all major global economies as we look at ship building the industry is currently like the way it has evolved over the years currently like it's highly concentrated especially in the uh, east asian region accounting for almost 85 to 90% of the current global production china is the market leader with an annual output close to 33 million gt followed by south korea which accounts for around 25 million gt and japan is about 16 million gt so considering the way things have been like more fluctuating in terms of geopolitics and otherwise if there is a disturbance in the region like it could be a man made eventuality be it a war or a sanction or it could be natural in terms of natural disasters if that region gets affected with that i think you know there would be a huge disruption to the ship building industry and the possible capacities that have been created in this region because we are highly concentrated in one region globally further if you look at south korea and japan they are going through a demographic evolution and a crisis and china may also possibly like you know go through that process in a period of time ship building is a manpower heavy industry the lack of large enough labor pool will adversely impact the shipyards in these countries as demand for new ships by the shipping industry and by extension the output of the ship building industry follows a cyclical pattern in terms of high and low demand a lack of capacity may not be evident till we reach the peak of the ship building capacity at which point it may not be immediately possible for the ship building industry to add any capacity or output rapidly enough currently if you look at the order book there is enough evidence to suggest that we are in such a spot right now if we look at the east asian shipyards they are fully booked up to 2028 and some yards up to 2020 2030 and any new orders will are looking at a delivery period post 2030 so that is the current scenario that we are in therefore there is a pressing need for the world to develop additional capacity and more importantly to have the same distributed across regions where local advantages can be leveraged india sees itself as one of the countries which is rightly positioned in terms of having the right set of industrial capacity skilled industrial labor force a large contiguous coastline strategic location along the indian ocean trade routes which has the ability to scale up brownfield as well as invest into greenfield expansion additionally if you look at the india's maritime trade currently like last year we are at about 1200 million metric tons last year and by the next couple of decades this figure is expected to reach around 5700 million metric tons per annum however like only 5% of the india exim trade is done on india owned vessels this is a area where our you know country and economy have concerns around 
So there is a lot of effort to see how we can, you know, support the ship owning and the ship building ecosystem. And uh, this volume, what India is doing is likely to grow five times in the next, you know, couple of decades. Globally, if you see, we are doing around 11 billion tons of uh, seaborne trade. That is likely to reach 20 billion tons by the next couple of decades. And within which India will have a significant uh, amount of share. So there is a clear, uh, you know, need within the country for us to, you know, look at this as a potential area. And at the same time, you know, when we look at this, developing this sector, it doesn't essentially mean that we are in outright competition with the East Asian economies. The way we look at it is, it's definitely with collaboration some of, from some of these countries and some of the European countries with whom we have a deep relationship. The expertise that have been developed in terms of technology processes and the ecosystems of ancillaries would be extremely beneficial to any new capacity buildup that is likely to happen. If new shipyards are to come up in areas such as India, it could be Middle East, it could be Southeast Asia or North Africa, there would be need to develop specializations best suited to their individual capabilities, supported by expertise from the likes of Japan, South Korea, Denmark, Netherlands, and the countries like that which have had prior long experience in shipbuilding. And one another critical piece which would play out is the green transition, the need for building green ships, the need for uh, even greening of the shipyards themselves. Like that's another important aspect, how green is our shipbuilding industry as a whole. So that would also need a lot of research and development, innovations, collaborations in terms of developing new designs, new techniques. How do we go about this? So furthermore, as the global shipbuilding industry strives to be carbon neutral by 2050, the green shipping and the developing the capabilities related to that are extremely critical. These technologies will no doubt have complex ecosystems from raw materials to finished products, all of which present potential business opportunities for the global maritime industry. Our collective ability to leverage the same will determine the future of this industry globally, whether we'll be able to have a more diverse ecosystem and a more diversified supply chain and shipbuilding capacities. This collaborative effort will ultimately like uh, lead to a scenario where we are able to create more jobs and prospects for our own countries and our own citizens. So with that, I would, uh, you know, conclude. Thank you. As I was thinking about this session, I was reflecting on uh, one of the first times I ever had any um, exposure to India was my father was a master mariner and he'd travel to Bombay and Calcutta in the 90s and bring back, you know, the old VHS videos from his time, spending time in Bombay and getting around the streets and then come back to Australia and sit us down in our very, very boring suburb and, and show us these videos. And I thought, oh, India's an interesting place. Maybe I'll, I'll get there one day. And today's a really nice full circle to be here in India and talking about oceans uh, and talking about the shipbuilding industry uh, just because it really uh, was, was sort of the catalyst for my interest in India. Um, so really great to have you all here today and I'm looking forward to what's going to be a really interesting discussion with our panellists. Thank you, Joint Secretary, for your comments. That was really interesting about India's ambition and the need to grow India's shipbuilding industry. And so with that, what I'll do uh, in this session is um, go through each of our panellists and, and I'll get your responses to some of the questions I've got, but feel free to, feel free to jump in and have a conversation. I'm not sure if we're doing questions here today. Maybe someone can uh, let me know if I need to make time for that, but otherwise we'll, we'll get on with it. Um, Arjun, the India opportunity, and not just India, but other countries in Asia, other regions like the Middle East, um, can you comment on India's readiness for this and what the viability is of the sector? I mean, I think about India as having plenty of capital uh, but does it have the technical skills in design and shipbuilding, the facilities, the shipyards required to meet these requirements for high quality shipping? Yeah, um, Aaron, if uh, I could just probably take a little bit of a step back and uh, just give some context on what's happening globally as a, uh, within the shipbuilding sector. So over the last four consistent years, uh, the order books of shipyards have increased globally. 
and they've now been crossing the three to four year time horizon for delivery. So we have essentially global shipyards having order books filled for three to four years, which is beyond the line that both ship owners and ship builders are usually comfortable operating in. Nobody likes operating beyond three years in terms of full order books. So that's one thing that has happened. Um, along with this, and one of the reasons why this is happening is not only is there demand for ships because of regulations and the age of the fleet, but we also have only 300 shipyards operating globally worldwide. That is 40% of the peak, which was in 2007 when there were 700 shipyards operating globally. And we don't see that much investment happening uh, uh, in new infrastructure coming up. With the case of India, now you have to add India to this. And India's, uh, the government has put in extremely ambitious plans for the number of uh, Indian flag vessels and the number of vessels that are to be built in India of those Indian flag vessels. They've tempered it because their plan is from up to 2047 and they tempered it with a interim plan of 2030. But even if you look at the tempered plan of 2030, it requires shipbuilding capacity in India to increase five times, which is dramatic. It would, it's never been done before in India, and that's really what the challenge is. India does need to do this because to reduce its logistic cost, and as a country that is pursuing the type of industrial policy that it is, requires to get this done. The big challenges, of course, are the wider ecosystem is not there in terms of the equipment suppliers. We rely still, and we used to, when we delivered ships to Europe in 2008, 70% of the ships, uh, the components came from Europe. Today, it's down to 35 to 40%, but that's still quite a high number. So we still need a lot of work to do in terms of developing the ecosystem over there. But um, what we are seeing is in India, the five large shipyards, the big challenge is five large shipyards that went bankrupt, only two of them are being revived into new shipbuilding facilities. Three of them are not being used for shipbuilding. So uh, we do need to develop more and more shipyards. Okay, so, I mean, that's talking about sort of the shipyards and, and, and the build and, and the requirements that way. What about from more of a regulatory and industrial relations and taxation context? Do you think that, uh, where is India at here? I mean, in Australia, our shipbuilding industry was unviable because of our very high labour costs for skilled labour or labour in general. Uh, and uh, when it comes to taxation as well, very high tax, tax, um, tax regime, what are, you, what are your reflections on in India? What are the regulatory things that might need to change to help drive this forward as well? Well, th there is the fiscal regulations which you're talking about on the taxation side. <clears throat> India generally has, from a corporate side, a very good tax regime operating right now. Um, so, uh, new manufacturing facilities until around last year were now getting a 15% uh, income tax rate. So, that is, uh, there's some good stuff happening over there. The other thing is that the government does give... Um, uh, a scheme to support shipyards, which was there even 15, 20 years ago. But this is the first time that we've seen that the implementation of the scheme is done extremely seamlessly. <clears throat> when you make an application within three to four months, the, uh, the funds are transferred, uh, which is fantastic. It allows, essentially what it allows, it allows you to plan your cash flows, shipyards to plan the cash flows. If you see the Indian shipbuilding order book, would not have been possible without the support that the government gives us. That's, that's for a fact, uh, and that applies to us. It applies to, I would say, it would apply to every other shipyard, including the government-owned shipyards. They would not be at the position where they are without the attention that the government of India has placed on the sector, and they've put the money where the mouth is in terms of giving that support. So that's, that's a big thing over here. Okay, thanks, Arjun. That's really helpful in setting the, the scene from an, from an India perspective. Harry, perhaps we can take a or zoom out a little bit uh, and have a look at what's going on globally in terms of demand, uh, particularly for different types of vessels, whether we're talking about bulk carriers, container ships, gas support vessels, tankers. What, what, is, what is the market demand out there? What, what is it that we need? Okay, uh, thank you, Erin, for, for this question. Um, I, I 
shifted the focus a little bit to uh, domestic used vessels in the, especially in the coastal shipping and in the inland waterway sector. As I think if you want to, let's say, build up as a shipping hub, there's a huge market which is, which is open, which is uh, the ships that are operating on, along the coastline and along the waterways. The difficulty there is that um, there is a, a big demand. There is a huge demand for new vessels in, in that sector, um, but the supply is very limited. And that doesn't have to do with the fact only that there's no capacity on the shipyards, but more that there is no capacity to build the ships that are needed in the future, fit for future vessels, which especially in the inland sector need to be green, need to be able to use renewable fuels. Um, so I, I would say that if, if you have a large uh, base volume in a domestic market, it's easier to build up also for the international market. In, in that respect, I have to make a big compliment to the uh, Ministry of Port Shipping and Waterways and to the Inland Waterway Authority, where they, are, where they are doubling the volumes every year. But when you are doubling this quick, you also need a fleet. So I would say if, if you talk to the, to the shipping companies on, on the waterways in India, their main worry is how can we get the vessel, but also how can we get a vessel that is affordable so that the, the additional investment cost that you have to make in order to make the vessel green or, or to increase efficiency so that your operational costs are lower, that is a part that is now difficult to cover. Because Indian uh, government, as we heard yesterday, is taking a lot of initiatives to, to uh, develop um, new types of vessels, green vessels, uh, subsidy schemes, uh, see the vessel as infrastructure, uh, the mortgage on the vessel, all those things are developing, but still the financing gap for the operator is something that, that needs to be filled, needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, I think you've touched on something really interesting there, which is sort of the, the business case for this green transition and what it means for the shipbuilding industry. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, to me earlier that India, you know, it has a lower capital expenditure, but very high operating costs. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, okay, so uh, let's say when, when, you, when you want to build a vessel which is, which is green, I think also if we look at the previous uh, session that we ha had here this morning, you have, to, you have to regain your additional investments. Um, if you look at the international benchmarks, there are good examples on how you can do that. You can, you can finance smart financing systems for, uh, for a business case um, uh, financing with involvement of the, a shipping company, uh, a shipyard, uh, an operator, um, a financial institution, and, and also the shipper. So if you finance such a uh, business case, that's one solution. The other one is to find solutions in, in terms of lowering uh, operational cost. For example, give tax incentives if you have a green vessel, lower your port use. Um, lower the waterway charges if you if you are using a vessel that meets specific uh, requirements. Also in the field of regulations you can do a lot. The Inland, Inland Vessel Act of India has some emission standards which are, which are not very progressive I would say but also that I think in, med, in, term, in number of years could further be strengthened so that there's also next from a push also a pull uh, factor where you can decrease your operational costs. And then I think that will make it possible to make a transition to, uh, to these new types of fit for future vessels. Yeah? yeah. Um, I'll go on to you now, Jose, uh, and have a chat to you about the Panama experience. Um, you know, some flag states have lower compliance and regulations than others. Uh, well, you know, they all meet international maritime organization standards, but there are, there are differences here. Um, now, let's imagine we get to a scenario where we've got all of the capital requirements, we can, we can do the bill, we've, we've, everything's in place, all the regulations are in place. What are the lessons from Panama, particularly in terms of India and mandating uh, India flag vessels, and what are the implications for the industry, and how can Panama and India work together on this? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Thanks uh, for our 
to ORF and uh, to the ministries for inviting us to, to be here today and to be able to speak to you. Um, Panama as a flag right now represents about 16% of the total world fleet. And this is something that has been achieved, achieved because we managed to change our mindset uh, year after year and adapt to the changing environment of the maritime industry. Right now we are again on, on one of those big changes due to, to the reduction of the carbon footprint. And as a country, Panama is one of the few carbon negative countries in the world. However, we have suffered that impact severely. Uh, we were uh, hearing this morning about the effect on the Arctic Pole uh, and the Antarctica, and we as a country, we already had to move a whole community out of one of the islands because of the uh, race of the sea level. Um, together with that, last year we had a major problem with the Panama Canal. Uh, because we didn't have enough water to transit all the, the ships that were coming in. Uh, that affected the, 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 um, how do you call, uh, the supply chain all over the, the, the world, basically. So that makes us be very, very aware of the situation that we are right now. As a registry, we try to work together with the chip owners. And we had... A, specialized not only on the large ship owners, but also on reaching the small ship owners on different countries, not only the traditional Greeks, uh, uh, Germans, uh, Norwegians. Uh, we managed to, to put together all the ship owners from Latin America and from all other areas, and we're trying to find solutions for them. So working together with India could be key to achieve a way to get to them and finding a, a way to reduce the average age of our, work, our fleet, which right now is about 16 years. So we need that, we need to reduce that uh, age, we need to find them a way to, um, to be able to modernize their fleet and to adapt to the new energies. Thanks, Jose. Um, on the subject of ship owners, perhaps then I'll pass over to Lena, who's from Norway and from the Ship Owners Association there. Um, Norway is so interesting because it is just such a big and important country when it comes to, to ship owning. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, you, you have plenty of innovative, really high quality vessels. And I did find out that my father has been captain on about six of them, which is very cool. Um, what, you know, um, what is it that, what positioned Norway? How did you get there as a country uh, and an industry? Well, uh, yes, I think uh, we're very proud of our maritime history. So I, pre I represent the Norwegian ship owners. So we have about 1,600 vessels and we represent the foreign going fleet. So the one further uh, away. And in Norway, we both have ownership, we have insurance, we have financing. And we have a huge technological hub, which is taking us into the green transition. And I think from a shipbuilding perspective, and the reason why this is so important to us is because we are in the middle of a sort of a double transition. We have the green shifts. Our members have decided that all of our vessels should be net zero by 2050. Uh, and at the same time, we're in a geopolitical shift as well, uh, where shipbuilding also comes in. And since COVID, we've been in a really good place when it comes to rates. So right now, I think we're in a shipbuilding boom. We have about 144 vessels in our order books at the moment, uh, and about 10% of them are here in India. But that's only in um, amounts of ships when it comes to gross tonnage, which has been discussed today. It's only 1.5%. So China is the main dominant uh, shipbuilding country for us as well as South Korea. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing that the world is changing, uh, increased tensions between United States and China, making India a much more interesting place for us to, to look at. Uh, and we're very optimistic about the changes that we're seeing, what we're hearing from the government side about 
what types of initiatives one wants to put in place. Uh, so we're very optimistic about a deeper collaboration with India, which we've had for 100 years, I think, in the maritime uh, domain. But I think there's a huge potential now for India to, to become a big shipbuilding country. But it's also important that we include, we talked about it, uh, the deep sea uh, fleet, meaning the larger vessels as well, uh, which is important for us. Lena, I've got another question for you, but um, before I, uh, I ask that of you, Arjun, I know you've been thinking about this geopolitical context and the need for diversification. What are your views on this from the Indian perspective? Yeah, um, I think one of the premises of this session also was uh, how do you build more resilient and decentralized uh, shipbuilding production in India and also globally. But if you're talking about decentralized, you're talking about not just in India, globally. And then what are the lessons that you can learn from the world's leading shipbuilding nations? But if there's one lesson that you can learn from the world's leading shipbuilding nations, always, whether it's China, Japan, or Korea, is actually national centralization. All these countries are nationally centralized when it comes to production. The design happens in those countries, mm -hmm. the equipments get manufactured in those countries, and the ships get constructed in those countries. All three of the, the, the entire supply chain happens in, the, in yes. these countries themselves. In India, are we ready for this, for all three to happen? No. Mm -hmm. um, design, we're not there at all. Uh, we don't have the ecosystem of having the right type of designers because the right type of designers need to have shipbuilding experience. That's how you design ships that are easy to produce, mm -hmm. that are efficient to produce, not ships that are theoretically great to produce, but actually very difficult to produce because you need to be competitive. I think that's really where Europe can play a huge role because Europe has that, but they've also gone through a demographic change, but they still have the engineering capabilities yeah. over there. So that's, I would say, on the design side. On the equipment side, again, it goes with the design, but you need the technical know-how. India is getting there, like I've said, but we are there at probably 50% of the level where we should be, but we are on the journey of getting there. Uh, but that's, again, another place where there can be collaboration with countries in Southeast Asia, but primarily, again, the place that I'm looking at, the region, is going to be Europe over there. Um, and then finally, in terms of construction, and that's really where India has a huge advantage because our demographics just support us. We have good quality workers. We have good quality uh, skills. Uh, there is availability of people. Um, the cost is increasing, but it's available. But we need to build the infrastructure. And fundamentally, we need to get the capital to actually be directed towards this sector in the next phase to be able to compete with particularly China. Uh, yeah. The big issue is refundment guarantees. So if I have um, one of the members of Lena's association comes and places an order on our shipyard and they give me an advance over a period of time and that comes to around 30 or 40 percent, I have to give them refundment bank guarantees. For that, to the bank in India, I have to put up capital of between 20% to 100%, depending on the type of company that you are, to be able to finance that. That becomes extremely difficult. In China, you have state companies actually giving that support, and the biggest advantage that they get to be able to compete and get these orders at the prices that they're getting it at is that. Yeah, that's really interesting context and, and I think a really good segue, Lena, to my other question, which was really about what incentives and what are the frameworks that Norway has used to uh, both build your industry but then support your industry going forward as well? Well, I'm not going to speak too much about the shipbuilding industry in Norway but, uh, because uh, it's, it's a different thing than it was before and that's because of global competition. Uh, most of the ships that are built in Norway are technologically uh, advanced, and I think that's also what sort of defines our fleets. We are, in terms of technological uh, or sort of value of our fleet, we're the fourth largest in the world. When it comes to gross tonnage, we're about the tenth. So a lot of our fleet is uh, advanced offshore vessels that are operating in the oil and gas sector, but now also increasingly in offshore wind sector. and. And so, but I think what uh, we're touching upon right now uh, regarding financing is, is important, having the right sort of structures in place to uh, make it feasible for owners to actually come and build their ships uh, in India is important. And I think uh, that's, India needs to be globally competitive. 
uh, and they need to be able to compete with China, but also when it comes to finance. But another thing is the technology. And I think that the, one of the reasons why China is also quite competitive is that they allow for foreign technology to be uh, placed in the vessels. And there is a lot of technological development when it comes to engines when it, in Germany and Finland and Norway and other places. And having a close collaboration on technological sort of uh, development on board the ships is also very important for some of the owners. They work closely with academic environments in Norway to develop new engines, new technologies to make their vessels fuel efficient or new fuels. And I think having an openness for collaboration and I think uh, the shipping industry is a completely global one where sort of national views, you have to be able to think internationally when it comes to shipbuilding as well. And, and I think we're already seeing very positive signs of that in India, but we need to continue to encourage uh, international collaboration. Thanks, Lena. Um, I now want to go to Shireen. I did notice that Jose picked up the microphone and I wondered if there was something he wanted to add in before I go to Shireen. I know I keep, I keep delaying to get to you down there, but we will get there. Did you want to add something, Jose? Um, I think that we're living on a moment that the car industry is also going through some transition similar, a very similar transition with electric cars. And China took a very good opportunity on that and we are also living uh, on a country that the Chinese cars are taking over the market just because they invested on the technology, they developed the right technology, and they are, um, they are basically killing their, their competition with, uh, of Europeans and Japanese and Korean cars with their prices and their technology. So there are opportunities there. Yeah, yeah that's a really good observation. Um, Shireen, I'm gonna come over to you now and I'm gonna take us over to, to Egypt and the Middle East. Really interested to hear uh, what your views are on the potential for the industry there. I mean, your family, your three or third or fourth generation shipbuilding family, your family's been in shipping for a very long time in Egypt since the 19th century. So really keen to hear your perspective, particularly on this diversification piece um, and, and where this conversation's at right now. Um, first of all, if I'd like to comment about what the conversation's been going on for um, with my colleagues here. Um, there has been a lot of developments with shipbuilding in, uh, in Europe post-World War II where basically the whole of Europe was devastated and there is a lot of, uh, of, of rebuilding required and there was a lot of money needed which was not available. But the Scandinavians uh, and particularly the Norwegians and the Germans, uh, although they were fighting each other during the war, uh, they ended up using the same model which was very interesting and that is called the limited partnership model or they call it in Norway, the KS model. And that KS model is basically going to uh, receive, uh, setting up a company that will um, take your tax as a person, as an individual, and you become a minor shareholder of that company, limited partnership. And with a limited partnership, of course, you need to qualify as a shipping company to be able to build a ship to, to purpose, and you need to be uh, cred 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 credible for creating a shipping company. That model worked very well and the European shipbuilding boost boomed at the time and uh, you saw a lot of ship, uh, ship uh, yards coming uh, out of nowhere and uh, building a lot of very sophisticated ships and so on. Now with the very high taxation and with the, uh, with the limitations on, uh, on, on various investments in Europe, and uh, the EU rules coming in and uh, all sorts of regulations and so on, this started to diminish and the, you know, the Europeans generally, the Germans and the Scandinavians, did not become competitive anymore. Now you've hardly got anything, any conventional shipbuilding taking place. I mean, when was the last time did we hear about a, sh a container ship being built in Norway or in Denmark or in Sweden? None. Uh, so what is really happening here is that the Norwegians specifically have targeted very much on the very highly, the high tech ships, like the offshore uh, facilities, like drilling ships, like, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, ocean research vessels. And the Finns, on the other hand, have concentrated on um, cruise ships, like the Italians and the, um, and the French. Uh, and this is basically where shipbuilding in Europe today stands. Uh, um, of course, uh, that doesn't stop ship owner, Norwegian ship owners building in China or in India, as, uh, as Lina was saying, but 
uh, that is that you know it's not really being built in Norway or being built in Europe anymore. So that's so far uh, what is happening with the uh, with the shipbuilding industry. It is shifted over to the what was uh, uh, the the cheaper or the the economical uh, builders, being Japan to start off with, and then Korea came along, and then Korea started snatching away a, a large market share from uh, from Japan, and now we have China coming in. When it comes to India, India is a different ball game altogether. India is, is supposed to be a big shipping nation because of the massive coast. You've got several thousand kilometers of coast and you need a lot of coastal, uh, uh, coastal shipping. And of course, also, it is a very big trading economy. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the largest importer of vegetable oils in the world, for example. Uh, so what is happening with, with India is that uh, uh, the Indian uh, government or India generally has suffered very heavy competition from Gulf, state, Gulf states. You have people like Bahrain, for example, Asri in Bahrain. You have Oman dockyards. You have um, uh, Dubai. And you also now have a new massive uh, giant coming in the MAM um, uh, from Saudi Arabia. Hyundai, um, uh, uh, I think, is the one uh, building that, uh, that uh, thing. So from there, these states are uh, very limited in their uh, in their uh, nation, in, in their um, civilization, not civilization, but in their, in their civil count, the, 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 there are not very many people there. They, so the, the, the exposure allows the country with, with their income, it allows the country to invest in things like that much easier than India, which is what, 1.2 1, 1. 2 billion people at the moment. So you have other priorities to, sub, to, to direct your budget to. And that is why India will need to, if you need to do, to build up a shipping, uh, shipbuilding industry, you have one of two options. The first option is either you implement the old European KG or limited partnership system. I don't know how the taxation works in, in, in India. Uh, or you can subcontract your businesses and uh, instead of having a major um, shipping company or shipbuilding uh, investment on your own, you can collect all the small shipbuilders and ship repairers and try to create a model like Costco shipbuilding, for example. They have a lot of yards and they have a lot of uh, equipment and they have a lot, but they're all under centralized control. So they give you better quality and they are able to compete on the market. That is, in my opinion, the best way forward for India shipbuilding to take place. Yes, Lena, you uh, want to jump in there, go for it. I feel there's so much talk about Norway, I have to comment on it. But I think just, uh, I think Norway has had an active maritime policy uh, and engagement on this from a political level for decades. And I think the, that's one of the reasons why Norway is such a big maritime country today. It's because it's been, there's been a political will and there's been a very close collaboration between the industry and the Norwegian government on maritime issues over decades, meaning that we've created huge maritime clusters that sort of, you, you get these sort of self-movement uh, of, uh, of uh, knowledge and technology, which is what, where we get the financing, we have the insurance, we have the technology know-how, we have the naval architects. All of these things work together to sort of emphasize Norway as a maritime nation, but it, create, but it takes, as you were said, policy, that's a political will and a political thinking that this is the way forward and that you actively have to sort of work towards it. It doesn't come by itself. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. And, and as someone who's from originally from the southwest of Australia, you know, think about our defense industry there and so on. It's kind of a similar thing, right? You find your niche and you've got that political will behind it. And, uh, and, and, and those industries will really, really flourish. Um, Harry, you wanted to jump in. Go for yeah, it. Yes, I would like to make a short uh, remark. Is we are talking whether India can compete with with uh, the other shipbuilding nations like like China or European, uh, Korean, Japanese. Um, f for me, th there's an easier way of developing the shipbuilding sector, and I, I don't want to repeat myself, but there is a huge need uh, on the domestic market and the bilateral uh, trade. I'll give you one example. When you look at transport between Bangladesh and India on the protocol routes, 90% is done by Bangladesh vessels because there are no Indian 
Indian vessels available. So I would say if you want to build capacity, if you want to build experience in, in building green technologies and set up your own R&D system, you need volume. And you, you need volume. I, I think you can create volume by focusing at the domestic market. And then once you have built that up, you have the base load and it's much easier to compete on the international market. That's, I, th I think there's a market that we are forgetting a little bit where there's no international competition. There's only Indian companies competing with Indian companies, but you need to build up uh, the right uh, capacity to build the ships for the future. Arjun, do you think that the industry in India is there? Do you think that there is the political will, the potential of the ecosystem and so on to really build this industry? So there, uh, there are two things. And we had a meeting with the additional secretary from the Shipyards Association of India a few weeks ago. And we, at the meeting, there were shipyards across every spectrum. Small shipyards, medium-sized shipyards, large shipyards. Everybody was investing in capital expansion, facility expansion or getting new facilities. Everyone, a small boat manufacturer to a large uh, shipyard that can make, build Panamax vessels. So everybody was doing this. <clears throat> so uh, I think in any business, if your technical skills are similar, if you have the infrastructure to be able to deliver a particular type of vessel, an industry in one country will be only, uh, if your cost of working capital is high, that's a poison pill that, you, uh, that will just never allow you to survive. It, uh, what the government has done is they have, since 2014, 2015, stepped in to ensure that Indian shipyards can compete on cost of working capital. Mm. That's, that's, what the, that's the first thing they've done. So they've set the baseline, which has allowed Indian shipbuilding to be where it is right now. That's the first thing. Uh, we are not more competitive than any other country. We are as competitive as good shipbuilding countries, which is allowing us to actually do that. So we, we, we do have the technical capabilities that clients are putting their trust in this country. I think now we do need to take it to the next stage. You can't do, uh, you need to do that step first before you go to the next stage. And now the next stage is going to be, how do you really ease not working capital, but long-term capital to come into the sector and really flourish. Uh, this means, this does not mean bailouts, but it really means enabling the right type of competition to be there within India, where shipyards can compete with other shipyards, which actually drives efficiencies. Yeah. And that's really what's coming on. And if you see China, Korea, Japan have all done this. They've not bailed out shipyards. Um, I've got one question. I think we might have to go to questions in the room because I can see microphones out there, which looks to me like people will probably want to ask questions. I've got one more, though, on, the, on technology was mentioned earlier in collaboration, and I could hear the people who come from security backgrounds, who come from more geopolitical backgrounds in, in the room kind of squirming in their chairs about technology from China, and we talk about this in other sectors. What's the view in, in the shipbuilding sector around using technology from China? Uh, is, is this something that the industry is thinking about and talking about? Does it matter? Or is this, or is this, does this geopolitical conversation happen in a silo when it comes to technology? Well, Who's brave enough to take that one on? <laughs> yes, yes, I think so. Um, no, I think um, technology from China generally varies a lot. You need to be very careful to be uh, choosy on what exactly you need and the quality you require. That is very important. And an ideal model for the Chinese involvement in shipbuilding in Egypt is Alexandria Shipyard. Alexandria Shipyard was a catastrophic uh, organization for quite a number of years because of various uh, labor problems and um, uh, social problems and so on. But suddenly uh, the Navy took over the shipyard and uh, they brought in the Chinese uh, Costco group to uh, reorganize and give it a facelift. And I think the brochures you have here will demonstrate that the shipyard has become uh, top-notch, although it's still dragging uh, the bad reputation uh, behind. But it is an, a, a top-notch uh, shipyard, very capable of building any type of ship, very highly sophisticated, and above all, very, very disciplined, which is very important, because what ruined the shipyard at the beginning was discipline. 
So really, when you come and bring in uh, uh, Chinese technology, you need to be very much aware of what you really need from the Chinese, exactly. The Chinese got a very big variety of offers to give you. And it's up to you to choose what suits you best and what is economically best for you. Doesn't mean that it is the cheapest option, because the cheapest option is usually the worst, but you can get a decent option at a decent price and you can work very well. And I can tell you, the productivity in Alexandria shipyard today is nothing short of, um, of Norwegian or, uh, or, or Chinese shipyards or any other international shipyard. I mean, they are building special sophisticated ships like, for example, frigates, like um, advanced tugs, electrically propelled uh, tugs and so on. So they, they have the technology and this technology was imported from China because the Chinese were the ones who helped facelift this shipyard. So I think, no, I, I think you've, got to be, you've got to know where to go when you are dealing with the Chinese uh, organizations. Lena and then Arjun. This is a question that comes up quite often um, since we build quite a few of our ships uh, in China. Most of our ships don't have Chinese navigational technology. They have Kongsberg Maritime, which is set up there. So we have Norwegian technology on board of a lot of the ships, even though they're built in China. Uh, but at the same time, we also have a lot of uh, consciousness around cyber security when it comes to our vessels. And uh, we have our own cyber security set up for the whole Norwegian uh, going fleet, uh, set up from our offices together with uh, the war insurance in Oslo. So it's something that we're very wary about, that we uh, know about. And, uh, but, so we, but in our navigational system, they're not Chinese. Not using Chinese technology. Arjun. Well, there's a difference between ships and cars. Cars last for five years, seven years. Ships are there for 30, 35 years. <clears throat> and when you get Chinese technology, you have to rely on the same supplier to support the technology over that period of time. And that's a big risk. And um, if you personally ask me what is the biggest risk in shipbuilding today is the supply chain. And for shipping, what is the biggest risk is actually also the supply chain yeah. because it's after somebody buys a ship from me, they don't really speak to me for maintaining the ship. But if they have a component over there that goes wrong or needs to be serviced, they need to go back to the original equipment manufacturer. And if that one is in China, then and there are geopo that, that's a geopolitical risk, definitely. Yeah, that's interesting. So the biggest ri risk in your industry is supply chain, including those parts that might potentially come from China. Interesting. Okay, uh, I'm looking at Paul Keaton, seeing if I'm allowed to take any questions from the audience. I'm not. Uh, we've only got four seconds, but if you are in the audience and want to ask any questions, our panellists will be outside after this, and please come up and say hello. There are so many things we didn't actually get to talk about or, or run through in this session, but uh, thank you all so much. It's been really interesting to speak with you all. Thank you to ORF. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming along to this session today. <laughs> <laughs>